Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Louis Brimacom from Tars Steel. Um, I think they're going to put my slides up now. I, uh, I'm the head of environmental technology. There's a group of about 50 people in my group, researchers mainly, chemical engineers, chemists, mechanical engineers. And we cover all aspects of uh, environmental performance of the steel businesses in terms of operations, but also about products and sustainability as well. Um, a part of that team, there's about seven people working on life cycle assessment uh, and increasingly on full sustainability, actually, so triple bottom line thinking. So I'm just going to take you through some of the aspects. It's quite a technical presentation because we believe that sustainability is something that's quite technical to get right. Um, you know, what is sustainability? Do we really know what it is? Absolutely. It's quite difficult to define, but I'm sure you're all familiar with triple bottom line thinking. Um, the circular economy, we all think, you say it, and you say, oh, yes, I know what circular economy is. It means doing more with less and so on. But in fact, I've spoken to about 100 people. I'm on a British Standards Committee on Circular Economy, and not one of us in the room is entirely clear what it is. So um, one of the things I think it is is how to make things better and not worse. Um, and to do that, sometimes you have to look at the life cycle and you have to really think about, well, if I do that there, it's great there, but what happens here? And the more information, the more data, the more understanding you have of your life cycle, the better. Um, invariably, though, it's uh, how to make things better, but who am I making it better for and in what respect am I making it better? So sometimes it's inevitable almost when you make a change to your product mix or your process routes Things will get better in one place, but you might transfer some burdens to another, or you might have a social consequence uh, on that. So, um, And so it's rare that you get simple, straight improvements that improve everything absolutely. So it's good to be aware of where you, your, your benefits are and where your, uh, your imp impacts might be. But we should attempt at least to get a, an informed answer. I think that's the, the main thing is to, a lot of our work is about uh, understanding the whole system and working it out. And as I go through this presentation today, I'm hoping to show you at the end a 2050 vision for steel. So sustainability, uh, you've probably, many of you will have heard about the 17 goals, the global goals. And a lot of those uh, have got social implications about alleviation of poverty, hunger, access to clean water and so on. There's uh, one or two of them on responsible consumption production, which is probably the closest thing to circular economy about material efficiency going through. So the 17, it's a little bit confusing trying to keep 17 things going, but it shows that if we are improving all these, we can say that society is probably getting more sustainable. But there, are, there is interdependency between some of these. And uh, for example, poverty alleviation may require more stuff. We talked about that before, about improving quality of life. So, uh, circular economy, uh, this is a new diagram that we've been debating at the British Standards Committee, so it's not for public uh, uh, use just yet. But it's interesting that in my view, and, and the, the committee was saying, actually, the best thing you do is make a product more efficient, actually make sure it's efficient in its use phase, which is not the first thing you think of. So it's circularity, and is initially people think about waste management or reduction of waste. But the idea is to have minimal inputs and minimal waste outputs, if you like. The hierarchy being efficient products, perhaps sharing, optimizing use, sharing society. And then life extension, that's a huge one. In other words, if you make products last for twice as long as they would originally, then you're avoiding the production of something new. And so on. And then through to re reuse or redistribution. Some of the terminology is, is in, under debate at the moment. Closed loop recycling is where you might have to remelt something like steel, for example. Um, so that's a bit of a hierarchy, a kind of a circular economy hierarchy, and that's probably, if, you, if you're working on that, uh, we're hoping that this will provide guidance for businesses uh, coming out soon. Life cycle assessment is something that our team does a lot of, um, and this is my definition of it, so don't go running off. And, but it's about, it, it's, it's difficult to say it measures things. It gives an indication of things. And the life cycle assessment part gives an indication of environmental impacts, really, environmental and resource impacts associated with some kind of activity or function. You don't do an LCA on, uh, on a bottle. You do an LCA on the delivery of a litre of beer, for example. Um, but it should include all the impacts from extraction, 
of raw materials from Earth through to the end use impacts, whatever that is. So, um, and as soon as you start cutting off parts of the life cycle, you might start to miss something important. The other thing about life cycle assessment is you need to define the system. And as a, that, that bit there shows, it is about raw materials, includes recycling. But it's not just about carbon. You collect a lot of data on various impacts in a system, usually all the materials in that come out of the earth, air emissions of various types, acid, uh, acid rain, NOx, SOx, and so on. Um, and then you take that inventory and you apply it into various uh, systems, some of which are pretty good. It's, it's fairly good at measuring carbon footprint. Depending on which methodology you use, it's fairly good at water footprint, but there's quite a few methodologies in place there. It's not brilliant at this one, but uh, some of the academics are very keen to progress that one, partly because sometimes concentrations are what cause human impacts, whereas LCA tends to deal with mass inputs and outputs, really. It doesn't tell you where the impacts are. But this is really the important thing. The big transition of, of our department in Tart Steel and it was the transition from just LCA to triple bottom line thinking in, in a life cycle context. So it's really, as we progress with improving products and improving services and so on, it's really about getting the balance. And one of my hobby horses is this aspect here, the social impacts throughout the life cycle. You'll hear about, uh, you know, corporate social responsibility, having well-being and safe workforce and so on, but there's also the social value of a product itself. Because if a product doesn't work very well, you'll probably discard it, or it'll, it'll go out of fashion very quickly. And then you'll end up with a new one. So the, the functionality of something is very important. A simple example is the early uh, low energy light bulbs where they struggled to provide enough light or they took an hour before the light was bright enough for you to read your book. And really, although it was low carbon and probably just about uh, okay on costs, it didn't work. LEDs, on the other hand, they're uh, much more of a win-win situation. They tend to be uh, bright enough and they do the job and we all like them. They're very low energy. They also have pretty good life cycle costs, the LCC there. The weakness in sustainability might be the affordability. In other words, it might cost 10 quid for a bulb as opposed to two or three. But in fact, the sustainability is pretty high. It's one of the few that's got a clear winner, I think. And if you're a policy advisor for government, you'd, you'd say, can't you subsidize LEDs? That would be a, an interesting way of getting the society to use them. Um, safety, uh, you can have, uh, for example, nuclear energy uh, may not be real safety, may be perceived safety. So I'm not going to get into a debate about whether it's safe or not, but that could stop you from progressing it. So addressing the triple bottom line is always important, but I think you should do it in a life cycle way. Um, we developed a British standard that helped to uh, provide a bit of guidance on this, and I urge you all to go out and buy it or look at least look at it. And uh, it basically says what I just said. You go through every stage of life cycle and you do triple bottom line thinking. Quantification, there's some qualitative stuff as well. So in Tata Steel, we use LCA and, and sustainability tools to recognize where we have hot spots, i.e. places where, for example, our blast furnace operation is probably the biggest impact on the steelworks. But the other thing it does, it helps to assess um, whether or not our products are more important than our processes. And uh, as you'll see in a minute, it clearly is. Um, it also helps, if you make a change in the system, do you actually make a big improvement? And how well can you uh, measure that and see that? The other thing it does, it helps with marketing a little bit. Well, first of all, I think I should say that um, the first time I got involved in LCA, which was a long time ago, 20 years ago, it was about competition of materials in automotive, aluminium versus steel. And that was a very interesting time for us. And the perception was that aluminium was a lighter material and therefore better for automotive. Since then, we've done hundreds and thousands of LCAs, and we think that actually, I'm going to tell the story in a minute, but it does help you to communicate and market the positive aspects of your products. And you, sorry, I should have mentioned also that in the construction industry, it's now a requirement to provide information on life cycle for environmental product decorations if you try and get BRIAM or LEED for your building. Voluntary stuff at the moment, but very prescriptive methodologies to get there. So this is a typical life cycle of, of steel. Um, the material production phase is, is where we are in our steel plants, but what we find is that when we produce a certain mass of steel, 
if it goes into a car and the car drives around for 10 years for 150,000 kilometers, then the amount of fuel associated with just that mass of that steel is some six, seven times greater than the impacts on the steelworks. So the first thing you realize, which believe it or not, my industry didn't realize this when we first started doing this, was that if you're going to make really big improvements, you should look at your products and look at how they are performing. And um, so we started to build life cycle tools, um, which involved a lot of years of data collection, data acquisition. We pay a lot of money for data every year. We have Gabby models, about six Gabby models and data sets. And it, it, we, we've managed to uh, build models that look at cars, that look at buildings, whole buildings, and including the use phase of buildings, which is a little bit trickier because you've got to have a separate thermal model to do that. But through that, we can work out whether or not a new cladding system or frame. There's been a big debate over the years about the thermal capacity of buildings. Is concrete better for cooling buildings down? Is steel better for uh, other parts? In fact, there's not much in it. It's, when you look at the thermal design of buildings, there's not much in it, really. But that was a great help to our, um, our teams. The other thing it does, you can do case studies, EPDs, something called a PEF. The Europeans are a debating methodology on product environmental footprints and trying to uh, determine the best methods of doing that. But an example of, of where policy and regulation came in was uh, in, in automotive. I showed you the, the slide about the use phase having the biggest impacts, and the policymakers realized this and thought, well, uh, for automotive, what we need to do is drive regulation about the, the use phase of cars. In other words, the CO2 per kilometer or per mile. And that happened all over the world, the United States, Japan, and all these regulated. The, the United States is just about catching up now with others. Um, quite successful. In term, as you all know, cars have become more efficient in terms of driving around the streets. And they've done that through energy efficiency measures, electric vehicles, and light weighting. But then if you look at the LCA, um, for example, just for the light weighting part, I won't talk about car batteries today, Clearly, the materials that offer better light weighting than steel have a higher impact on the primary production phase. So the question is, which is better overall? The thing it did, though, was it drove steel to go from mild steel to advanced high-strength steels as well. So if you see, the, the we can get 25% weight saving with, a, with our highest quality steels now. Uh, aluminium can do better than that than get 33%. And this is for one particular component. But then that means that if you have a higher impact at the beginning of the life cycle, because the material's got more impacts, how long do you need to drive the car around before the aluminium matches the car? And the, the different gradients here are to do with the fuel efficiency of the cars. For the higher end, longer lasting cars, probably aluminium. For the medium sized cars, lower end, probably steel. And I'm, I'm showing this not to say one's better than the other, but do the LCA to understand it and understand the parameters in your LCA. It's a crucial thing to do. So that's driven us to look at how can we improve the sustainability or the eco-efficiency of our products. A lot is to do with durability. A lot is to do with energy efficiency of products going forward, which includes the light weighting of, of certain steel components and so on. Um, and also, we feed, obviously, our materials into renewable energy uh, systems as well, which is you know, a positive thing. You can't be, and then there's these developments such as uh, transpired solar collectors, which are twin-layered steel cladding panels with holes in, believe it or not. You can't see the holes, they're very small. But as sunlight hits it, then buoyancy takes the warm air up and into the building or to preheat boilers, things like that. But the thing is with these, these are great products, or integrated solar panels. These are great products, but getting the industry to take them up, God. It, there's so much inertia. I think the word inertia was mentioned this morning. There is a lot of inertia. So um, I'll quickly skip this one, except to say that we have measured that if we develop these new products, how much more energy does it take to make these new products, and how, what are the benefits of it? And roughly speaking, some have got huge benefits for a very small increase of, of steel increased usage. But on average, we, we get six times the benefits in the use phase than we do in the production phase. But what's going to happen is, as, the, as all of our systems decarbonize the use phase, either cars or buildings, you're going to probably be putting more stuff or triple glazing on buildings or 
batteries in, in cars, electric vehicles and so on. And so you end up with a higher burden of the materials and also possibly a compromise on the recyclability as well. So increasingly now, and this is where the introduction to the circular economy comes in, it's now important to really understand the source of materials going forward. It's also important to know the source of the energy for use there as well. But uh, So things here, this looks at uh, some of the uh, recycling ratios of different materials in construction. And uh, there's been a lot of work in timber, for example. They, they, I think their piece of work that said 58% to landfill, they then did, really did do some improvements and changed that. But it's a question of what is the value of recycling? How are you using your recycling? For steel, we have very high levels of recycling, but not very high levels of reuse. And reuse is a higher, a higher grade um, value, or high value optimization, if you like. So this kind of thing is made hugely important. Um, so LCA has a role in understanding the benefits of circular economy. Should you build more robust products that last longer, because they'll have a higher life cycle impact in the manufacture, zinc coatings, for example, to extend life, and so on. So really, and should you compromise functional efficiency to make products more recyclable? I think probably not, but then you need to the LCA to check it. And uh, composites on airplanes is interesting for that, really, if it's, if it's reducing the fuel consumption of the flights. But you end up with a, an end-of-life problem, which is best. Not sure. And then you're trying to work out what is, the, what is worth recycling. Um, all recycling processes will have energy consumption, and all transport distances will as well. And it tends to be that the local economies work better for, um, for the circuit economy and life cycle. Um, but there are barriers to the circuit economy. This is something we're debating in our standards committee. And the barriers are all across the life cycle, sorry, all across the supply chain as well. Technical barriers, behavioral barriers. And when you look at this, actually, you start to think, crack, it's going to be quite difficult to actually really, really get the circuit economy going. But I think that uh, we had a great presentation this morning that showed the supply chain and working together across the supply chain is one of the answers. And Ian Bamford, when he came, asked me, what do the universities need to do? It'd be nice if the universities started to bring together the supply chain to break down some of the trust barriers that are there, because I think it's got to be that kind of approach, really. But in each one of those, I, I know people in Tarsus Steel who've really wrestled with this idea and decided at the moment we can't make money out of reusing steel but we ought to in the future. So I'm now going to hopefully um, go to my last slide, which is a, an animated slide about what I think steel will need to do in the next uh, 50 years or so. So the steel plant 2050, uh, this part of it is similar to what we have now. It'll have an electric art furnaces to melt scrap, but they'll be highly efficient electric art furnaces. We'll have some kind of primary steel making, primary processes, but there'll be lower carbon processes. And that might involve carbon capture and storage, although I'm not a fan. Better still, carbon capture and utilization. But you're going to struggle to get away from carbon as a reducing agent. But the big change will be this. The sites should have a whole manufacturing warehouse where we are bringing products back and reusing them or remanufacturing them to get it through. I'm not sure what the ratios would be. It'd be great to say it'd be 50-50. But there's a lot of factors to try and get that sorted out. Um, the scrap inputs to our processes, at the moment we can melt all the scrap and we're fine just about. But it means that we, we have some alloys, niobium, vanadium, boron. Are we optimizing the recycling of those that are part of our scrap? Copper and tin could affect the quality of steel. It's better to take the copper out in the automotive shredder, sorry, prior to the automotive shredder. So if we get smarter about separating alloys, understanding where everything is. We also might have additive manufacturing, powder technology or filament technology, whichever you, way you look at it. Um, and that will enable us to have bespoke shapes uh, going forward. I mean, there's huge challenges here. This is 2050, by the way, folks. So, But then all this is meaningless. With that. And also, yeah, understanding and improving the, the byproducts and how we are uh, either adding value in byproducts or, if, for example, if you've got carbon capture utilization, what kind of value would they have? One example of CCU for steel would be taking CO2 to make algae 
algae could make omega-3 and a few other things, maybe food for, for, for cattle and so on. But all this is, is, is probably not much use without us understanding what the customers are going to want in 2050. So car manufacturers, the OEMs, will, will there be car sharing? Will it be pervasive? Will there be much smaller vehicles? Will they be all made of composites? They might decide to do that. We want to make sure there's some opportunity for steel. Construction, we have this vision of buildings being taller because well, there's not much land space left and there's going to be more people, so perhaps structures will get higher. Uh, I have this fancy idea that we might start building cities on the oceans. Maybe the Pacific might have some floating cities that move around. So, you know, those structures might change. But basically, they're going to want a different thing from us, and we have to have some kind of partnership in the supply chain and really understand what's going on. What would they accept if we change the product offering? How can we improve the yields of their processes by providing different things to them? So the, uh, it begins to build up shapes that are near a customer needs, um, working very closely with them. The customers also might help us with scrap quality. That thing I talked about earlier, they might be the first stage of making sure scrap is separated out. At the moment, as I say, it's not necessary. It's necessary for aluminium more than it is for steel. It's very important to keep the grades separate for aluminium. We might be renting and leasing rather than selling, but whether or not we can make money out of it, I don't know. And who would make the money out of it? Would it be us or would it be somebody else? Uh, and then, of course, there's the use phase. Uh, one thing that I think we need to do is make sure that we understand all the information about our products and track them, because if you're going to reuse them afterwards, you want to know things like the fatigue exposure. Mm. And it, 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 we need the technology to try and get there. Once we've got, and that's kind of internet of things, it'd be nice to say that we know where all of our products go and where they are now in which buildings, which cars, and that when they dismantle it, we can get them back because then we know they're ours, if we own them, that is. And then the end of life, uh, value optimization by better separation techniques or at least more careful dismantling of buildings, that kind of thing. And then the last part of this is the technology readiness level and whether they have a business model. Um, so the low TRLs are the biggest challenges for us, additive manufacturing, for example. But the other huge one here is the business models. Do we have a business model or do we not have a business model? And all the ends are basically saying we can't do this now. We cannot make money or even understand the supply chain about how the transactions would take place to make money. So that's a vision. Uh, there's about 30 years of research there, some of which should be done at universities and some of which should be done by the steel industry, some of which should be done by working together across the supply chain. And that is all I want to say. Thank you very much.